So this is chapter 8 in your textbook. And the word arthrology is also a word you'll see associated with joints. So you guys have probably heard of um, arthritis. So basically that's an inflammation of the joints. So anytime you see the word itis, that's inflammation. So arthritis is inflammation of the joints. So what is a joint? A joint is also the fancy word for that is an articulation. It's a site where two or more bones meet. So where two or, two or more bones meet or articulate is a joint. In this case, this is a humerus, this is an ulna, and then where they come together is the joint or the articulation. And we're going to talk about different joints, what makes a joint a joint, and how you can determine what the function of a joint is. Now, why do we even have joints? What's their function? Well, they allow us to have mobility. And that allows bones to move against each other. It also holds us together, holds our skeletons together. Now, these are two terms that we're going to use in Unit 2, but you're also going to see them in Unit 3, so you kind of need to know which one's which and remember what they do, what they do. Tendons connect muscle to bone. Ligaments connect bone to bone. So what do I mean by that? Let's pretend this is the knee joint. This is the femur. This is the tibia. So this is the knee. Okay? You've got these big things called quadriceps. You're basically the muscles on the top of your thigh. But they can't just be floating out in space. They actually have to attach to the bone. So the little piece of the cartilage, the little attachment points that attach the muscle to the bone are tendons. But you also have pieces of connective tissue that connect the bones to each other. And those are the ligaments. So they're bone-to-bone -bone connections. Now, when we classify bones, we classify it in several different ways. Uh, the first way we classify it is based on its function. Does it move? Does it not move? Because some joints, can you think of a joint that doesn't move? The sutures in your skull, those are joints. That's where two bones come together and articulate. Do they move? No, not when they're fused. They don't move. All right. So we can identify them as synarthrotic, amphiarthrotic or synarthrosis, amphiarthrosis, and diarthrotic or, di or diarthrosis. The word syn, that prefix means together. Okay? So that's an immovable joint, one that doesn't move, like in your skull. Amphiarthrosis, okay, that's slightly movable. And the way I remember that, have you ever heard the word amphi associated with anything else? Amphibian. An amphibian is both water and land, right? Kind of both ways. So amphi means both ways. It can go both ways. So it's slightly movable. Diarthrotic is freely movable. The prefix dia means freely movable. Have you ever heard the word dia in front of anything? <laughs> Diarrhea. So that's basically freely movable. Exactly. That's where the word comes from. Freely movable bowels. Okay? So that's how you can remember. And we see it's dia it moves a lot. Amphi kind of both ways. And sin means it doesn't move at all. All right, you can also uh, look at joints based on what they're made of, what their structure is, what, the, what material is holding those bones together. It can either be a fibrous joint, and this is usually used uh, as a fibrous connective tissue. It can be a cartilaginous joint where the bones are connected by cartilage. Or it can be a synovial joint, and that's a bone separated by a sac filled with fluid. Synovial joints are the ones that you hear when you pop. Okay, when you pop your joints, that's what you're hearing. A synovial joint, here's a bone. Here's a bone. There's basically a sac of fluid between those bones that allow those bones to move against each other. Most of your joints are synovial joints. Like I said, that's the one, any ones that you can crack or pop are synovial joints. Okay, so let's talk about three types of fibrous joints. That means they're connected by that fiber. You have what are called syndesmosis, sutures and gomphosis. A syndesmosis is something held together by ligaments and it's, uh, it's amphiarthrotic. It means it moves just a little bit. 
A great example of that is the connection between the fibula and the tibia. You have these little pieces of fiber, you can see it here, that connect these bones and allows those bones to just slightly move against each other. And that, when you're uh, standing up and you're kind of balancing, those bones will just slightly move to help you stay balanced. They don't move a lot, just a little bit. You have sutures, and they're synarthrotic. They don't move at all. So this is a suture inside your cranium. Little pieces of fibro tissue, fibrous cartilage between those sutures, holding it together, and they don't move. Once, once, you're in a, once your soft spots, your fontanelles have closed, those bones no longer move. So after about two years of age, those are solid sutures that won't move. The third type of fibrous joint is a gomphosis. Again, these are synarthrotic. They don't move. And you see these inside uh, your jaw where your teeth, uh, teeth go, the alveolar processes. So this is a little tooth sac where your tooth goes, this little fibrous connective tissue holding that tooth in place. And so your teeth don't move. They're held in place. Unless you've got scurvy or something where your gums are damaged and your teeth are falling out, your teeth should not move unless you've got some kind of gum disease. Um, if you want to use... If you want to pronounce it gom, uh, gomphosis instead of gomphosis, it may help you know where it is, okay, because teeth are in your gums. Doesn't move. All right, the other type of joint, we've done fibrous joints, are cartilaginous joints, and these are bones connected by cartilage. There's two types. There's synchondrosis and a symphysis. The first one is the symphysis. Okay, it's a piece of fibrocartilage, and this is between your two hip bones, between the two pubic, uh, the pubis of the hip bone. They're connected by a symphysis. Another symphysis are these little spaces of fibrocartilage between the vertebra, and both of these are amphiarthrotic. That means they do move a little bit. Think about when you bend over, these little pieces of cartilage will compress and move just a little bit so that you have flexibility. When would you expect this to actually move? When you have a baby. So in childbirth, that's going to stretch a little bit and move so the child, the baby, can come out of the birth canal. Now you have another kind of synchondrosis. And this is hyaline cartilage. So where the symphysis was fibrocartilage, the uh, synchondrosis are hyaline cartilage. And they're synarthrotic. That means they don't move. An example of that is this joint at the first rib and the sternum. So this first rib and the sternum, it doesn't move very much. When you breathe in, you have a movement kind of in the, the uh, inferior part of the sternum, but the top part of the sternum doesn't move a whole lot. So this one is a synchondrosis. The other one that's a common one is the epiphyseal growth plate or the epiphyseal plate. That's actually a joint because that's two bones, right, joined together. They don't move. So that's a synarthrotic synchondrosis. These terms are kind of tough. You just have to, you know, play with the words and um, put them together. Uh, what did I say sin meant? Together. What is chondrosis? What do you think that means? Cartilage. So together with cartilage. Okay, so the other, the third type is a synovial joint. And that's when two bones come together or articulate with a cavity full of uh, a viscous fluid. So this is your synovial joint. These are freely movable or diarthrotic. So these are your most movable joints. Most of the of your joints in your body are synovial. Um, if you're wondering how the word synovial came about, so maybe you can remember what it means. What does sin mean? Okay. Ovial, that's the, the root word is... Ovum. You may want to know what an ovum is? An egg. This stuff that makes up the synovial cavity is like the consistency of egg white. So it's basically held together with egg white is what that's basically saying when you say synovial. There are six types of synovial joints. Let me go, let me see one more thing. Let me, let me do this first. Let me give you some um, examples of the, the different anatomy of the synovial joint. So you've got your bone. Got your bone. Each bone has some hyaline cartilage, okay, that surrounds the end of the bone. 
And then uh, continuous with that, connected to that, is a synovial membrane. So those two come together and basically make this articular capsule or this sac. And then inside that sac is the synovial fluid. So you can see those bones don't actually touch. They just kind of move and rock with that fluid between them. Okay? So that popping sound you hear, that's basically that, that egg white shifting from side to side. That's what you hear when, you, when, you're, when you're popping a joint. Okay. Now, before I go to the six types of uh, synovial joints, I've got one more thing to say. Associated with synovial joints are what are called bursa. And bursa are basically designed to reduce friction. So it's basically a synovial sac with synovial fluid. But instead of being between two bones, it's usually somewhere where a ligament or a muscle or skin or tendon rubs against a bone. So let me show you a picture of that. That's, the that's what a bursa is. So here's your humerus, the upper bone of your arm. Here's your hyaline cartilage, articular cartilage. Here's your scapula, which you call your shoulder blade. Okay? And you see, it's not these two bones rubbing together that's being protected. There is a ligament that's lying right on top of that bone. If that ligament and that bone were allowed to touch, every time that bone moves, it's eventually going to just deteriorate that ligament, basically rub it through, just wear it out. So you put a bursa, your body makes these little bursa, these little mini synovial uh, sacs, between that bone and that ligament so that you have free movement. So you don't get any irritation or tearing up of that ligament. So you're going to see, so if you heard of bursitis, that's inflammation of the bursa. So wherever you've got a ligament or a tendon or a muscle that's lying on top of a bone and there's a, fr a, a, a reason or a, a, a friction area, you're going to have a bursa. If that starts to thin out and break or bust, you get bursitis. You, uh, you, it, it could be the ligament that's torn, it could be the tendon that's torn, or it could be bursitis where the bursa is actually damaged. Uh, the torn rotator cuff is actually usually a ligament tear. Okay, so the six types of synovial joints. And they're based on basically the movement that they do. You have hinge joints. These are very common. We're going to give you some examples of those. You have plane joints, pivot joints, condyloid joints, saddle joints, and ball and socket joints. So we're going to go through each one of these and give you some examples of the different types. Um, you'll see this on the test. There'll be, there'll be some questions. You know, the joint between this bone and this bone is an example of a what type of joint. So, for example, um, the, um, let's see if you can just guess this one. The joint between the femur, which is your upper leg, and the tibia, which is your lower leg, what kind of joint do you think that is, just based on those names? A hinge, yeah, it just basically does like that, like a door hinge. That's a hinge joint. Okay, so a hinge joint goes in one plane of motion. Basically, all it does is lay to flex and extend. So, flex, extend, or your fingers. Flex, extend. Your leg, flex, extend. Just one movement. Common ones are your knee, your elbow, and your phalanges are your fingers. So those are hinge joints. Plain joints are also called gliding joints. And basically, that's just a little bit of a movement, slight movement back and forth. So you see that in the bones of the foot and the hand, in the carpals and tarsals. Pivot joints allow rotation. The common one that we learned in lab last week was the atlas or C1 and the axis C2. When you put those together, you can rotate your head and say no. What, what allowed you to say yes? Do you guys remember? I heard it. What? The occipital condyles and the... Atlas. So when you put the, the occipital condyles of the occipital bone on top of the atlas, you get to do this, right? You get to say yes. All right, another example of a pivot joint is the joint between the radius and the ulna in your lower arm, this particular joint. Now, when you do this, this is a hinge, okay? This is your humerus and your ulna that do this. When you 
pronate or turn your hand down, see the pivot, the twist? That's a pivot joint. And that's the joint between the radius and the ulna. You have what are called condyloid or ellipsoid joints. And these are joints that basically allow you to make almost an oval in space or a cone in space. So take your finger and if you do this, you can go in all these different directions. You can go up and down, side to side, or you can make a circle, okay? That's not the same thing as a hinge joint, okay? If you look at the hand, these are your carpals. These are your metacarpals. Where are your metacarpals? No. They're in the palm of your hand. That's what's making the, so they're, it looks like fingers, but they're in the palm of your hand. They're covered in muscle and fat. When you get here, these are your actual fingers. So what we call our knuckles, that joint between the metacarpals and the fingers, the digits, those knuckles, that's the condyloid. Your fingers can only do that. Your digits, they just do that. But your carpals, your metacarpals and your um, phalanges allow you to have that condyloid movement. Saddle joint. There's just one. Well, actually, there's two. There's one on each side. And that's at the junction of your thumb, where the metacarpal of the thumb and the carpal of the wrist come together. And it allows you to have what's called opposition. You can touch each finger. And that is a characteristic of primates. We have opposable thumbs, which means we can do this. Other animals can't do that. Mm-hmm. And then the ball and socket joint. The two ball and socket joints are where? What do you think? Your hip and shoulder. And these are the most uh, movable, the greatest range of motion, all types of movements. You can go up, you can go down, you can go front, you can go back, you can go round and round and round. All right, so most freely movable, most range of motion. Which one do you think has the greatest range of motion? The shoulder. Yeah, unless you work for Cirque du Soleil, you can move your hips in some really strange ways. Your shoulder is much more movable than your hip, okay? A lot more range of motion. All right, so that's basically the introduction to arthrology. Let's go, and I want to look at uh, joint movements real quick, and then we're going to talk about joint disorders. So joint movements, and I'm going to kind of go through this kind of quickly because we're going to talk about it in lab as well because so many of the joints that we talk about when we talk about movable joints have to do with the appendicular skeleton, and that's what we're going to cover in lab this week is the appendicular skeleton. So as we talk about some of those bones, we're going to talk about some of those, uh, those movements. So I'm just going to kind of run through these um, kind of quick. Um, if you are in physical therapy or PTA or radiology, if you want to be a radiology tech, um, you, joints is something you need to be focusing on. So even if, if, uh, if I'm telling you it's not that important for the rest of you guys, if you're, if you're interested in PTA or radiology, you need to really look at Chapter 8 and really start to know that stuff because that's the kind of stuff that you guys will be focusing on. So you usually only have two or three PTAs or radiology students in a class of 60. Um, so for the rest of my class, it's, it's, you know, we want to know some of it, but we don't have to know it in as much detail. But for you guys, if you're thinking about that, then you've got to know your joints. So if you have any questions, come ask me because you want to make sure you understand anything that there is to know about joints because that's what you're working with. When, somebody, when, you, when a patient comes in to a physical therapy, what are you trying to do when you rehabilitate them? You're trying to give them back their flexibility, okay, and that strength and flexibility, flexibility is of a joint. So you've got to know what these words mean. So I throw this section in right here, basically for you uh, uh, PTA and radiology people. Um, there are some other words you may see associated with joints. They're called non-axial, uniaxial, biaxial, and multiaxial. And these are words that you'll see written on orders. They'll say you need to work the non-axial joint or the uniaxial joint or the biaxial joint. And you've got to know what that means. So non-axial, what's an axis? Like in math, okay? The X and Y axis. Non-axial means it doesn't really move in a direction. It just slips. Uniaxial means it only moves in one plane, okay? So that could be either rotation or a hinge joint. 
Biaxial means it moves in two planes, like the knuckle. It can go up and down, left and right. And multiaxial means it can go in any direction, up, down, left, right, forward, back, anything, like your ball and socket joints. So these are terms you may see associated uh, with joints. <clears throat> There's a table, 8-2, that basically puts everything you need to know about joints on one page. So I'm going to go through some of these and just kind of show you how to use this, uh, this table. Um, I've gone over most of this in my PowerPoint. What I haven't gone over is some of the different uh, types, where it says like plane or pivot or hinge. What I really want you to come away from on this particular slide is how do you name a joint? Okay, and what is its uh, function? Is it a hinge joint? Is it a pivot joint? Is it a condyloid joint? That's what I want you to be looking at on this particular table. So let's just do a few. Um, how do you name a joint? Basically, it's usually named based on the bones that it's connecting. So for example, the atlanto-occipital joint is the joint between the atlas and the occipital bone. Okay, and it's actually a condyloid joint. Now I told you it did this, right? So you're thinking, well, that looks like a hinge joint. Well, it is a hinge joint, but you can also do this. It allows you to give you that motion. That particular joint allows you to spin your head around in several directions. Okay, so it's a condyloid joint as well as a hinge joint. Um, these intervertebral, that just tells you it's between the uh, vertebra, vertebral costal, between the vertebra and the ribs. And these are both plane joints. They only move in one direction, like a, like a, like a, they're kind of, gli or, um, they're gliding joints. They just barely move. Let me skip on down to the ones. If you look on this page, you'll see we have ball and socket joints, hinge joints, pivot joints. So when you take this, uh, this um, uh, table, you might want to highlight the different types of joints, focusing on hinge, plane, condyloid, saddle, things like that. For example, the shoulder is also called the glenohumeral. That's because this part of the scapula or your, uh, or your uh, shoulder blade is called the glenoid fossa. So the glenoid humerus or glenohumeral, this is the humerus. So where those come together is the glenohumeral. Uh, That's your ball and socket joint. Your elbow, you'll notice, has two joints. You have a hinge joint between the ulna and the humerus. You have a pivot joint between the radius and the ulna. You can see your plane joints here between, inter means between, so between the carpals. Your saddle joint at your thumb. See plane joints and condyloid joints. So just use this as a way to, to kind of put it all together. Like I said, we're going to do more and more of this in lab as well. All right. Now, a few more, this is kind of going back over some movements, and we're going to do these here in just, uh, just a second. We're going to talk about what these different words mean. Different types of movements. When you talk about uh, a joint, you say, does, is it a, does it flex? Does it extend? Does it abduct? Does it adduct? And these are words we're going to define today and also in lab. These are words that you need to remember not only for Unit 2, but also for Unit 3. When we learn the muscles, not only do we learn where they are, we learn what they do, okay? So for example, your biceps brachii in your upper arm is called a flexor, okay? Because it flexes that joint. It pulls your lower arm to your upper arm, causes that joint to flex, so it's called a flexor muscle. So you've got to learn these not only for bones, but also for muscles, so you can't just put them away and forget about them. So let's go through some of these. Um, movements. And I've listed them all for you, but we're going to go through a uh, picture so you can see it. Gliding joints, these are ones that just barely move, just barely move. You see that in your wrist in the carpals. That's a gliding movement. Flexion, extension, and hyperextension. Flexion decreases the angle Extension increases the angle, and hyperextension goes beyond extension. So, for example, if you bend your head down, you flex, and you raise it back up, 
you extend, put your head way back, hyperextend. Okay? So you have flexion, bringing an angle together. Extension, bringing that angle further apart. And hyperextension, going beyond extension. You can do the same thing with your body. If you bend forward, you're bringing this angle, making it more narrow, you flex. When you stand back up, you extend. If you lean back, you hyperextend. So that's flexion, extension, and hyperextension of the vertebral column. You can flex other joints. Here's the, the leg. If you flex the knee, okay, you're bringing the lower leg up to the uh, upper leg, bringing that angle closer together, you're flexing. When you straighten the leg, you're extending. Um, unless you've had a really bad injury on the football field, you shouldn't be hyperextending that knee. When you hyperextend a knee, that's usually called a, an injury. <laughs> so you don't typically hyperextend a knee unless it's damaged. Um, if you've, the shoulder joint, bringing the sh shoulder uh, forward is flexion, bringing the shoulder back is extension, and then even further back would be hyperextension. Now some other movements. Abduction, adduction, and circumduction. You may hear the terms abduction and adduction, and that is very common to hear physicians and nurses instead of saying adduction and abduction because they kind of sound the same. I say adduction and abduction so that you'll know what they're saying. If you abduct something, what are you doing? You're taking it away. So abduction moves something away from the midline. Adduction brings it toward the midline. And circumduction, like circumference, makes a circle. So let's look at some examples. If you take the arm away, you're abducting. If you bring it back, you're adducting. If you're doing this, making a circle with it, you're circumducting. Okay? And we're going to talk about the different muscles, like I said, in Unit 3, that allow you to make these movements. Rotation. I've shown you two examples of rotation in the neck and in the arm. So rotation of the head around C1 and C2, that's rotation. You have rotation around the ulna and the radius when you do this. You also have rotation. This is rotation of the hip. So if I just take my foot and put it out, it's not my foot that's moving. It's actually my hip that's rotating, okay? So that movement's coming from here. That's moving my foot. So that's rotation of the hip. So you have lateral rotation, means you're, you're, putting, you're going away from the body. Medial rotation, bringing it back in. Now that rotation in the arm of that radius and ulna actually has two more specific names called supination whoops, and pronation. Supination and pronation. This is rotation of the radius and ulna. When you pronate... You turn your palm down or back if you're in anatomical position, and that crosses the radius over the ulna. When you supinate, you turn your palm up or in anatomical position, and now those bones are parallel. So that's just, those are two fancy names for rotation, pronation and supination. Now there's a muscle in the arm that is named for that movement. Anybody remember what that one is? You've had 201 before? Or if you're just a big a muscle freak and know all your muscles? Pronator teres. And it's the, it's the actual muscle that makes you do that. It moves, it causes that movement. Now, there are some special movements some, uh, of the foot. Dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Now you'll notice there's no extension. They're both, they're both flexion, okay? So dorsiflexion is pointing your toes up. And plantar flexion is pointing your toes down. So dorsiflexion, up. Plantar flexion, down. Why do you think that's called plantar flexion? Where's the plantar region of your foot? Yeah, right here. If you have plantar fasciitis, you're talking about the bottom of your foot. All right, two more special movements of the foot. Inversion and eversion. And that's talking about the sole of your foot or the bottom of your foot. 
Are your feet turning inward so your soles are facing each other or are they facing away? If they're facing each other, it's inversion. If they face away, it's eversion. So here's the sole of your foot uh, going toward the midline, inversion, laterally, eversion. Now this is really important uh, in uh, looking at children as they develop their walking skills. Runners, okay, so you've ever had like knee or joint or hip problems when you run? One of the things you can do is, especially got a fleet feet over in Huntsville, they will put you on a treadmill and they will videotape you running. And they're going to look and see, is this the part of your foot that's hitting first? Or are you running on the outside of your foot? Or are you running on the inside of your foot? Because you're not getting the best shock absorbing from your arches. And so what they'll do is they'll put you in a tennis shoe or a running shoe that basically causes your foot to go the other way. So if you tend to land on this part of the foot, they're going to put you in a shoe that's going to basically rotate your foot over and make you hit more flat. If you tend to rotate on this part of your foot, they'll put you in a shoe that causes your foot to be in the other way, and you're going to again, hit your, on your arches more flat and have more shock absorbing and less damage to your joints. So that's what you're looking for if you're having knee, ankle, or hip pain as a walker or a runner. It may be that you're everting or inverting your feet. All right, some other movements. These are movements uh, basically forward and back. Forward and backwards. Protraction and retraction. Protraction moves your something forward. Retraction moves something backwards. A good example of that is the mandible. If you jut your jaw out, make it go forward, that's protraction. Kind of bring it back in, kind of like a jam neck when football players kind of do like that. That's retraction. Two other words for the jaw or, or other body parts. If you lift it, it's called elevation. If you lower it, Depression. Again, the mandible is a great example of that. If you raise your jaw like you're closing your mouth, you're elevating the mandible. If you lower your jaw like you're opening the mouth, that is depression of the mandible. Who remembers what joint is working there? The TMJ, the temporomandibular joint. Okay, what two bones are making the temporomandibular bone, uh, joint? The temporal bone and the mandible. What particular parts of those bones are making that joint? The mandibular condyle and the of the mandible and what what's the depression on the temporal bone? Mandibular fossa. So where the mandibular condyle and the mandibular fossa come together makes the TMJ, that temporal mandibular joint. All right, and the other movement is one of that saddle joint of the thumb called opposition. And that allows you to to do that, which is, like I said, again, just an example of what primates can do. All right, one more thing and we're done. Nope. These are joint disorders. I'll give you t this is the PowerPoint. If this is the video that uh, Meg Graham does. I think her video is fine and her PowerPoint was fine. So I told her I was stealing. I wasn't going to make my own. Why, why reinvent the wheel when there's already one made? So this is her PowerPoint. Give her full credit. And I'm just going to basically go back over it. If you've watched the video, then you've seen this before. And if you haven't, it'll be uh, new information. Um, just kind of review. Here's the knee joint. So what's connecting the femur and the tibia? got ligaments connecting bone to bone. Now, in the knee in particular, you've got several ligaments. You've got several uh, ligaments to help stabilize that knee. So if you've ever heard of a uh, knee damage, you've heard of your lateral collaterals, your medial collaterals, or your ACL being torn, that's what they're talking about. The anterior cruciate ligaments, your ACL, your medial collateral. That means it's the, the ligament on the medial side of the knee. Lateral collateral, that's the ligament on the lateral or outside of the knee. So that's what uh, those words tell you. You hear that all the time and don't really know what it means. Okay. Two common injuries, two common orthopedic injuries are sprains and strains. We tend to use these the same. Everybody, oh, I sprain my ankle, I strain my knee. People use them interchangeably when they actually mean two different things. A sprain is of a ligament. A strain is of a muscle or tendon. Okay. Now, you have the same treatment because it really doesn't matter what you did. If you, if you hurt your ankle, you either sprained it or strained it. Sometimes it doesn't really matter what, what you actually did, but the treatment is the same. You do what's called the RICE. 
which means you rest it, you ice it, you put compression on it, and you elevate it to try to get the swelling down. So um, many times a sprain or a strain, we tend to minimize that and go, ah, you just sprained your ankle, big deal, who cares? Actually, that can be a really bad injury that will take forever to heal, okay, because uh, these tendons and ligaments are made out of connective tissue, and connective tissue doesn't have a lot of what? Blood vessel, not a, not a lot of blood supply. They're slow to heal. So sometimes it's actually better to have a broken bone than it is to have a sprain or a strain. A broken bone will actually heal faster than a sprain or a strain because it can take a lot longer time for that to heal. So don't, don't minimize somebody that's got a sprained ankle. It, is, it can be a big deal. It can be very painful and, and slow healing. All right, bursitis. Again, we've talked about that. The bursa are those little uh, synovial sacs. And here's one here. This is the patella or your kneecap, and there's the ligament that's, or actually this is a tendon on the patella. This is a tendon that's holding that, um, this muscle, this muscle, and then the, the patella is right underneath that tendon. So to keep that tendon from rubbing against that bone, you put a little piece of bursa in there for that, um, for that to decrease the amount of friction. Um, you're going to see bursitis if you tend to do things that are repetitive. Okay, so uh, if you tend to like lift things all the time, work on a factory line and you're always lifting something heavy or doing it over your head and just doing this same motion over and over again, like I know at Goodyear, you know, they pick up a tire and they put it over here and they pick up a tire and they put it over here and they pick up a tire and they put it over here. You're re doing the same repetitive injury to the same repetitive joint and you can wind up with uh, bursitis. As usual, this tends to increase with age because everything's starting to break down and wear out. You, tra uh, you treat it with the rice, rest, ice, but you may also add some NSAIDs, uh, some non anti-inflammatory medicines, maybe physical therapy, or possibly a steroid injection. Osteoarthritis. Osteo means bone, arthritis of the joint. So basically, this is a common form of uh, joint pain. It's the most common joint pain. It's osteoarthritis. And what's happening is the top layer of cartilage. So here's a bone. Remember, every bone has that little piece of articular cartilage along the, along the uh, end of the bone. That's wearing down. So that's wearing down, and those bones are now making uh, contact. Okay? So your bones are basically rubbing together. And that causes pain, swelling, and redness. Sometimes, because that uh, bone's being damaged, in order to defend itself, it'll make little bone spurs to try to uh, make up for the loss of cartilage, and that usually winds up being even more painful. Why do you get osteoarth uh, osteoarthritis? Some of uh, the risk factors include being overweight, uh, more weight is putting more pressure and more uh, damage on those joints. The cartilage is just wearing down faster. Getting older. If you ever have an old joint injury, like an old football injury, an old knee injury, elbow injury, that joint may become arthritic over time. can be genetic. And any time you've got, like I said, a stress injury from uh, overuse of a job or a sport injury can cause osteoarthritis. The diagnosis, you're looking at stiffness of joints, swelling, and maybe a crunching feeling or sound. It may sound funny or you can hear it crunch. That could be a sign of osteoarthritis. You treat it with exercise, weight control, rest, and sometimes they'll give you uh, pain, pain medicines. Now, osteoarthritis is generally of a specific joint. Uh, it's not necessarily systemic, not your whole body. It may just be one or two joints in your body are osteoarthritic. Rheumatoid arthritis is very different. Rheumatoid arthritis affects almost your entire body, okay? It's an autoimmune disease. That means your body is, effect, is attacking itself. It no longer recognizes your joints as you and is starting to attack them. It can happen in children or adults, so it doesn't, it's not necessarily age-related. Same, um, same symptoms, pain, swelling, stiffness. It also uh, can cause deformities. Have you ever seen someone with, uh, with rheumatoid arthritis of the hands and they, their, their hands are almost curled and they're real, the joints look really, really uh, 
large and gnar and kind of real large looking. Uh, so it can cause those joints to become deformed. Again, it's usually in more than one joint. It's usually systemic. So if you have a rheumatoid arthritis, it may be in your hands, it may be in your feet, in your hips, your elbow. Common in middle-aged women. Uh, treatments are anti-inflammatory and immune suppressors, physical therapy, and surgery. Mm -mm. You can just treat it but not cure it. Now, Lyme arthritis is a third type of arthritis, and it's caused by a bacteria. We've heard of Lyme disease, and this is the bacteria that is carried by the deer tick. Early symptoms of, Ly of Lyme disease are rash, fever, and flu-like symptoms. Now, the thing about Lyme disease you get it if you've been out in the woods, you know, you've been hunting or hiking or whatever. You come in, you get a tick on you, you take that tick off. A couple of days later, you oh, don't feel good, you got a little bit of a fever. All right, but you've also had three kids at home and they've all been coughing and sneezing and you're probably at work. So you just blow it off as the flu or the common cold and don't really pay any attention to it. Don't make the association that it was from the tick bite that you had. Okay? That's what happens a lot of times because the same early symptoms are just like having a cold. So one of the things you need to make sure you do, if you're out in the woods, if you ever get a tick on you, number one, take it off as soon as you can. But then go ahead, take a permanent marker, Sharpie, ballpoint pen, Band-Aid, something, and mark that tick bite. Okay? Just make a mark so, so you can remember it. So you go, oh yeah, I, got, I, I had a tick here. If in two to three days or within a week, you start seeing something that looks like a bullseye, a very specific bullseye rash, that is a telltale sign of Lyme disease. Okay, that means the, the tick that bit you is a carrier. And if you catch it at this stage, you can take an antibiotic because it's caused by a bacteria, and you're done. You've now beat Lyme disease. You don't got to worry about it. But what happens is a lot of people don't ever see that. They, they don't, it may have bitten them here, or, you know, like, a, you know, think about where ticks typically bite you, usually around a waistband or a sock band or something like that. You may never see the rash. So if you ever get a tick, you know, have your wife, your spouse, your boyfriend, somebody, check you for ticks, okay, and watch for that rash. Because if you see that, you start to have fever and a rash, you can take an antibiotic and, uh, and get rid of it. If you miss these symptoms and you go untreated, the second stage uh, can develop. It's called the midterm stages, meningitis. Uh, the meninges are basically membranes that surround the, br uh, the brain. So meningitis is inflammation of those uh, membranes. Cranial neuropathy, you may have some, you know, confusion, things like that. Pericarditis and myopericarditis, where is pericardial? So inflammation around the heart. And then late, if you've gone through these stages, you still have it, you didn't treat it, um, you wind up with Lyme arthritis. And it's usually a lifelong battle. It's very painful. Again, uh, it comes from a place called Lyme, uh, Lyme County, Connecticut. It's where it was first identified. Uh, it wasn't identified until people were already in the arthritic stages. So they didn't realize what was going on. There was a bacteria causing Lyme disease. So a lot of people wound up with Lyme disease back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s until they finally realized what was going on and how you could treat it early. So now, if you live in Alabama, we do have Lyme disease here. It is here. It has traveled south. So you tend to be outside like I do. You want to make sure you're wearing uh, tick repellent or um, permethrin, which actually kills ticks, and make sure you watch for whenever a tick bites you and, and you mark it. Um, if you have a dog, people say, well, the dog ticks carry it. Uh, the, t the type of tick that's on a dog typically does not, but if you've been out in the woods all day with your dog, <laughs> he could have picked up a deer tick as well. Okay, so you get home and you're rubbing your dog and that deer tick, that's not the dog tick, is, to, is on him and now that deer tick is on you. So anytime you get a tick, treat it like it's a deer tick, treat it like it's a carrier. So the deer ticks go to you like they do? Oh, yeah. Deer ticks, and deer ticks are usually tiny. They look like a freckle. You just, you don't even realize you've got them on you half the time. They're, t they're small. Uh, it can be. Lyme disease early on can be misdiagnosed as MS. It's, it's misdiagnosed as a lot of things. That's why, you know, if you know that you had a bite, you know you had a rash, 
that's a big telltale sign that that's where you're leading. Because if you if you're in, in this stage, it could be meningitis due to anything. It could be uh, any kind of brain. T- they, they don't know what to look for. All these are indicative of a whole lot of different diseases. So this is where the misdiagnosis typically occurs. No, there's Rocky Mountain spotted fever, there's tick fever. Ticks carry about five common diseases uh, in our area. So you need to treat any tick bite with respect. You know, if you have, if, you, if within a week of a tick bite you have any kind of strange symptoms, you need to go straight to the doctor because there's about five different diseases. Most of them are short-term diseases that can be treated regularly. Lyme disease is probably the one that's going to, you know, that can stick with you forever, the one you want to really deal with. But Rocky Mountain spotted fever can be fatal. So there's several that you want to, like I said, anytime you get a tick bite, treat it with respect. It's not just a, it's not a, you know, a, a, a small thing to deal with. Just like a mosquito bite, you know, we all get bit by mosquitoes every day, every year, probably four, five, six, seven hundred times. Just takes one that carries malaria or dengue fever or um, West Nile virus. Okay, one mosquito, and then you're really, really sick. So you want to treat any kind of insect bite with respect because all these insect bites do have the potential to carry diseases, especially if you're traveling outside of our area. If you go to Key West, dengue fever is back. And we don't really associate dengue with North America. Okay, but it's made a resurgence. So if you go to um, um, Key West, they have a resurgence of malaria and dengue fever. So what do you have there? The Everglades. What do you have in the Everglades? Lots of mosquitoes, so you have to treat those with respect. All right, just a few more things to say. Again, we always end with lifestyle changes. Uh, we've talked about this before. By the time you're two years old, your skull has reached its full size. Your fontanelles are closed. Um, your sternum, remember we talked about your sternum last week. It's actually three bones. Okay, so about two years old, your, st- your sternum has now become one bone. As you get older, around your 40s, you start to see joint stiffness. And it may or may not be arthritis. It may just be changes in collagen. What you want to do is keep your activity and your exercise going throughout your life. The more active you are, uh, the more exercise, especially low impact, like walking, yoga, things like that, the more low impact exercise you can do to keep those joints flexible, the longer and uh, the, those joints are going to stay healthy and the less problems you will have. All right, that's all I've got for today. I will see my lab people. We'll have a quiz on what we did last week.